and I'll quickly repeat that. Um, in the Unit 2 test, make sure that you're only addressing the questions using works from Unit 2. Don't go back to, to the previous Unit 1 um, material because you've already been tested on that. So um, the structure of the Unit 2 test is the same as the last test. So be sure and look back at that last test if you didn't score as well as you'd like to. See where the issues were for you. If you ran out of time, you might want to consider starting with the latter portion of the test first, the essay and the short answer. Also remember, only answer the number of questions. Um, for example, if it says choose three of the six following pa of passages, um, then only choose three. Please don't answer all six um, significant passages because I'll only grade the first three. I don't have time to see which ones are the best answers and that kind of thing. Um, also, please remember that when it asks for speaker, the speaker is not the same thing as the author or the poet. That's one of the things we're going to emphasize in just a minute when we talk about the poems that you were to read um, for this modern poetry section. Um, they're just sort of representative poems that I chose. Uh, so remember that speaker, especially in poetry, um, but definitely also in, in short fiction, uh, is not the same as, as the author or the poet. Um, very rarely, you know, normally authors slash um, uh, poets create personas, they create speakers, they create narrators. And so often you know a little bit more about the narrator than, um, or if it's first person, of course, you know who's doing the talking, or if you know if it's a character that's talking. But I'm going to, um, as we look through these four uh, poems especially, I'm going to give you some information, of, a little something about the speaker so that you can see the distinction between them and the actual poet. Um, the only other thing, a recommendation I would make at, at approaching the unit to test is um, to prepare for it. Be sure and look back over the um, discussion boards and the questions that you've had. The discussion boards especially um, should gear you toward how to uh, the information that's considered important within that particular work. And don't only look back at yours and my responses to what you've written, but also look at what other people have written because especially, for example, the, um, the uh, Washington uh, and Du Bois uh, discussion board, you could choose certain aspects of what they wrote to compare and contrast. And there were a wide range of responses. A lot of them were really very good. Same thing with this last Hemingway uh, discussion board talk, discussing symbolism. Um, there were quite a few symbols in there. There, um, not, there are some that are more popular or obvious than others, but there are quite a few that you can address, so it would be helpful to look back at what other people have written. Finally, I always provided some biographical information. Be prepared for at least one question to concern um, the, the poet or, or and or writer's life and what he or she wrote. Okay. Um, so I'm going to pause there and see if anybody has any questions in general about the Unit 2 test. It will open Friday morning at 8 o'clock and remain open until Monday night. Okay, if not, uh, I want to add a couple of comments about the independent reading assignment uh, and the, the essay that you're supposed to write for me. Originally, it was due Monday night, but because I was not available, um, my daughter was in the hospital uh, most of last week unexpectedly, and so, um, of course, I was out of the office and was unable to answer any questions. Um, so I, I thought it was only fair to give you some extended time because I did want the opportunity to be sure to point out a few things about this particular essay. Um, the essay itself, uh, I've given you three options here to write about setting, to write about uh, either the, the author, if it's a memoir, um, so the person's writing about his or her own life, um, or to write about some conflict, um, more, one or more conflicts within the, um, within the work. And now, it's, not, it's a nonfiction piece, but these still seem applicable, uh, just depending on what you read. So you would choose one of these on which to focus. Um, a couple. Of, this is a relatively short essay, 600 to 750 words is, is rather sh uh, brief. Um, and um, in addition, you, know, you do need some title. You do need a bibliographic entry at the end following MLA formatting guides. And I believe I provided you with uh, a couple of web uh, links to help you 
know how to uh, to create that that particular uh, bibliographic entry for your work. You do need to cite page numbers if it's a print text, which I'm assuming most of you are working from a book that you held in your hand. Um, you shouldn't do research for this assignment. This is a, a not a research um, paper. It's just your observations uh, and your analysis as you read through. But it shouldn't be written from first person, even though you're the one doing the analysis, rather than say, I think, I believe, and that kind of thing. Um, that actually sort of lessens some of the impact of the analysis. Instead, let the, the, the support that you provide do the talking for you. Okay? Um, it should be focused and it needs to have a thesis, and you do need to include information to support your main ideas. Um, the biggest problem that I usually run into with this particular assignment is that students will end up devoting a great deal of the paper to telling me what happened me the reader, okay? Um, and I don't need to know what happened. You don't need to some, you assume that I've already read what you've read. And, and for not all of the books, but most of them I have. Um, so, so you don't need to like give me, tell me what happened. That's plot summary. Um, instead, what you should do is pick out those portions of the text that help support the point that you want to make about conflict or about um, how this this particular character changed or grew, um, or you know something uh, that you want to focus on about setting. Um, so that that's how you decide which plot events to leave in and which to leave out. Is uh, it's totally based on the point you want to make about either setting, about the speaker, or about conflicts. Okay, I hope that's that's clear. Uh, and the the most effective way to write about literature is the way that you show rather than tell, which is what we English teachers like to say, um, is by actually making a point and then quoting from the text itself to illustrate that point, uh, to show how it's true. Uh, literally, you know, uh, direct quotations. And just be sure to put page numbers at the end of that. That's all that you need as far as an in-text citation. Right, I'm going to pause there and see if anyone has any questions about this assignment. It is due Monday night if you haven't already turned it in. If you have turned it in, and based on what I've just said, you realize you need to make some changes, you can still overwrite your assignment until uh, Monday night or Monday. Um, the turn it in drop box actually freezes what's in there on Monday. But until then, you can overwrite it, which means you know you can upload a paper on top of what's already there. So you can make changes. All right, I'm going to pause and see if you have any questions about this. Um, the, okay, let me go back to your question, Mark. Um, let's see, for the title of the book, if it is a memoir, does the memoir part of the title need to be included in the bibliographic entry? Uh, a Wolf at the Table, and it does include a memoir by a father. Um, yes, normally what you would do is um, a Wolf at the Table, and that's where you would put the colon. Um, there are two ways to handle it. It would be a colon, then a memoir of my father, or you could put a Wolf at the Table and then a parentheses and memoir of my father. Colons are more frequently used for subtitles, um, so, um, but yes, you would need to include both. Does that answer your question sufficiently? Okay, great. Anybody else have a question about the paper before we get into um, poetry assignments this week? Okay, if not, um, I think that you've seen this particular PowerPoint before, but because we're working a lot with symbolism, I want to review very quickly um, with you a couple of things about universal symbols because they appear in three of the four poems very dominantly, um, and it, it kind of helps understand and bring meaning to, to what's happening. Excuse me, water break. Um, so a universal symbol is when there's really wide agreement. Oh, okay. Let me go ahead and ask um, the guideline about page two. Page two in, in the PowerPoint. 
it's like part of mine is not is not showing up. This particular, are you talking about this PowerPoint? You mean the, the handout for the essay? Okay, let me go back to that then. Okay. So what is your, what is your question? I did have some dates here. I did have a few students who did email me their drafts last week. Um, and I took a quick look at them and gave them some feedback. Um, and then the other part of this is how your page is supposed to look. Uh, we're using an MLA page formatting as well as the uh, documentation format. So it's your name and then underneath that English 2130, underneath that my name, underneath that the date spelled out. And then um, this is a really short paper, so normally you don't have to have page numbers on when there's only like roughly two pages. But if there were, then what you do is you put your last name and the page, your, uh, and the page number here, and then you center the title of the, of the page here. Um, what, what other questions do you have about this? Uh, do not include events. Okay, um, tell me, are you talking about on this page or the previous? I, I, I missed you here. It was to you. Is it one of the bulleted items? I'm not sure to what you what you're for. Point guidelines for writing about oh for writing about literature. I don't have that pulled up here. Um, I tell you what, let me look at it and I'll email you separately. Would that work okay? I didn't I didn't upload that PowerPoint to this presentation. Okay, yeah, I'll I'll be sure to take a look at that and let you know and try to clarify it for you. Okay, unfortunately, it looks like not all of my symbolism uh, uh, posts came through. Uh, universal symbols tend to be interpreted the same way widely. Um, so, and there are certain symbol patterns that are used frequently to signify the stages of life. For example, um, and this is where you can tell my visual did not show up. Um, so um, I'm going to, going to use I think the one visual, well, none of them actually did. Um, the seasonal symbols, um, the, we tend to think of, we associate the east, like the sun is rising in the east, the east uh, directionally, uh, we tend to associate with spring, uh, with youth up through roughly, um, you know, whenever you start establishing your career and your family. Uh, so these days that's gotten older and older, right? So that, that spring period of your life is usually zero through early 20s at this point, sometimes a little later. And then the, the summer of your life, if we're talking about seasons, um, we tend to associate with when you start your career, you establish your family, you know, we put down roots, it's rather, you know, you kind of go deep. Um, and then the fall season of your life is a little bit later than that. So usually if, if we're talking about age maybe 50 to roughly 65, that's gotten, as we've lived longer, that, that kind of range has gotten older as well. And that's when you, know, the, you sort of see the fruits of your labor, your kids are grown up, you have grandkids, that kind of thing, um, you know, uh, retirement and so forth. And then, um, and then winter is associated with old age. 
Um, and again, that's gotten older as people stay in the workforce longer, stay more active, have lived longer. Now there are corresponding, uh, other corresponding symbols. Um, and those age ranges are pro approximate, by the way. Um, so the four directions as well as the 24 hour days follow that same cycle. Um, the east, if you think about the sun rising in the east, that's the beginning of the day, that's the beginning of life, that's associated with spring, everything's new, everything's fresh, you think of spring green, growth, everything's sort of projected outward. Summer is, would be um, the south, very associated with the direction of the south. Um, and it's very rooted and grounded and still sort of outwardly projected. And then as we go into autumn, um, that's the west. Think about the day is dying in the west, so the sun going down, things are sort of getting darker. Um, and that's the period of life where you start to go inward more. You become more reflective. And these are just generalizations, of course. And the reality is it doesn't always um, associate it. It's not always connected with age. There are people who stay perennially young. You know, if you've ever heard of people referred to as sort of still being Peter Pan, refused to grow up, that kind of thing. And then there, there are some younger people who are very, very grounded and very reflective and tend to have more of the, uh, an aspect of older age. Um, and then winter, of course, would be north. Think about the north wind, the cold. You know, but there's something beautiful about every season. Uh, and I've got an example here. Yeah, the youthful period of life is characterized by energy and newness and hopefulness and growth. Also, they make a lot of mistakes, can be very naive, can be impulsive, can be rash. My apologies to any of you who may be in that age range. Uh, do not mean this disrespectfully. Um, so every, every season has its own beauty uh, as well as its own challenges. And... Um, the, the same is true with the 24-hour day. Um, the four direct, in the 24-hour day, um, you know, morning roughly is sunrise, so that's through about noon, and then noon to roughly four or five o'clock would be equated with summer, which is equated with the south, right? And then um, as we get into autumn, which is equated with the west. I mean, those of you, are, for example, uh, fans of uh, the uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, you know, think about them sailing into the west, right, as at the very end of the, the, the uh, book and the very end of the show, um, Bilbo Baggins sails into the west, and the whole idea of going off to this sort of latter part of his life. Uh, and that's associated with dusk, you know, sundown, and then, of course, nightfall would be associated with that sort of old age period um, which is also the north um, symbolically and uh, as well as winter. Um, if you've ever, you know, if you, if you watch a movie and it begins in the winter, you can almost guarantee something's going to die. Uh, it could be a relationship, it could be a person, but often those symbols do work in that way because we sort of interpret them universally that way. Um, for example, Robert Frost, who's one of probably the most famous poets next to Shel Silverstein in America, um, has this poem, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Um, whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. Um, and the poem is set on the coldest day of the year, which is, or the short, which is the shortest day of the year, um, which is December 21st. That's winter equal. That's the... Um, winter solstice. And so the whole idea here is somebody who is either facing old age or is just kind of facing something that he wants to give up on, the end of something. And so the snow symbolizes that. I mean, a lot of, you know, a surface reading, it appears to be about, um, it appears to be about just this lovely little landscape. But Frost poetry is much deeper than initially it appears. And what's going on here is somebody struggling to keep going. And so the, the, the woods, the, the fact that it's nightfall, it's very dark out, uh, it's winter time, uh, and it's a very, it's the shortest day of the year, the shortest amount of sunlight, all indicate um, symbolically that this person is facing the end of something and is struggling to get through it. Um, so I hope that, that sets us up a little bit now to get into the poems themselves. I hope. A quick word about the modern period. Um, 
you know, the modern period is dated in, in literature uh, from between the two world wars, starting with 1914, even though that's not when America got into World War I. Um, we were later, I think 1917 was when we actually entered World War I. Um, but it begins roughly that period and ends at the end of World War II, which is roughly 1945. And um, this period in American history was very chaotic. Um, there was so much going on in, in terms of, of uh, upheaval. There was a lot of change, um, ur increased urbanization. People were moving, for, for example, you know, you've read that, that lovely piece starting. It's traditionally one of uh, most of my students' favorite works, um, the, the Weber Rosicki uh, short story. And the people were increasingly moving away from the country and into the city to usually make more money. Um, also, with the industrialization and, and the family farms, and we still see that to this day, family farms were still decreasing, um, and um, especially the younger generation uh, were pursuing dreams in other places rather than staying on the farm. Now, that's not always true. There's certain, you know, most of us who live in rural North Georgia um, are connected to uh, in one way or another, at least have observed families that have been here for generations and often still have um, many generations uh, who still live here. But um, the others of us have been quite aware of, of the fact that there's been an influx of people that move to urban areas. And what happens is that kind of breaks down more the extended family to where um, they get, you know, the people that you can rely on get a little bit, there's a smaller pocket of that. Um, and that's one of the things that, that the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock is about. Um, it, it's about this sort of very isolated, neurotic man uh, it's a, who's set in this sort of dismal cityscape. And that's part of what T.S. Eliot, the poet, is trying to explore there. Um, so we'll talk more about that in a second. But, you know, with um, psychiatry, it became more prevalent. Um, religion, there, were, there was a lot of shakeup in, in religion, especially with, with um, a lot of that was happening with science. People went, you know, we, we didn't go to the moon, but there was the telescopes and the, the, the range that we had to be able to discover planets and look out. And then there were all these questions that happened when people started looking out. And, okay, well, it, it, it didn't necessarily always square with their religious beliefs. So in other words, a lot of, there was a lot of shaking in this period of time. And then, of course, uh, we underwent the Great Depression. Um, we underwent, the, you know, with the fall of Wall Street in, in 1929, the Great Depression, the, the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. Um, there was just a lot of, of, uh, of upheaval at that time. And so a lot of the poetry actually reflects some of the, the fragmentation, as well as the experimental nature of, of what was happening then, because in, the, in addition, you know, technologically, we were taking off uh, with the advent, of course, the, the movies and, and, and radio, and then increasingly um, the TV, although that definitely preceded, um, you know, this, this uh, that's more of a postmodern issue, which we'll talk about um, with the last unit. So we're going to start, I'm going to not necessarily take these in order, we're going to start with, uh, with um, Mending Wall, which is a poem by uh, Robert Frost. Again, Robert Frost is probably one of the most well-known poets, um, his, in, in American poets, his poem, especially The Road Not Taken, uh, is frequently quoted, especially at graduation ceremonies and, and so forth. Um, this little poem as well, uh, notice that it starts in spring. Um, so that should tell you immediately that something's afoot. Um, that, this is, that there is a chance for something new, um, a chance for growth. And that's part of what the speaker in this poem, again, not the poet, <clears throat> but the speaker is trying to explore it. We don't know that Robert Frost ever had, we do know that he you know, did um, live rurally and had a, a little orchard, but we don't know that he necessarily ever had an experience like this. What we do know is that he, um, this is the thing about writers and poets and playwrights. They use their imagination and they combine that with their observations and their experiences sometimes, yes, but, but you cannot say definitively that 
they actually experience this. Therefore, you can't say they are the they are the one doing the talking. They create speakers who do the talking for them. For example, Emily Dickinson, who was a um, very popular um, female poet, not during her time, but certainly after her death, um, has written as, a, as an old man, uh, has written as someone who experienced death. None of those happened, obviously, but those, that was, um, those were the personas that she created. Okay? So um, if we were in a face-to-face -face class, what we would do is we would read this poem aloud two times, because poetry actually it helps to, to read it aloud to get the sound effects. It's also very difficult to ever read something just one time and understand it fully. There's always something new that you can see um, or find in a poem. So I'm going to read it and then um, and then pull out some some key ideas from uh, what we're reading. Something there is that doesn't love a wall that sends the frozen groundswell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun. Now this particular wall is a, a wall made of stone. Um, you can still see a few uh, walls like this, I think, scattered throughout North Georgia. But certainly, if you've ever um, driven around, I think, in the Northeast especially, um, but, as, but if you've ever been to the British uh, Isles uh, particularly, you will see stone walls. You will see um, they actually take boulders and rocks of all different kinds and make, and make the wall out of them. And they're not cemented together. There's nothing that holds them together, just their weight. So notice that we know that something, there's a mystery here. Something is tearing this wall down, all right? This sends the frozen groundswell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. So there are places in this wall that two people can actually walk through together at the same time. Now, the speaker is beginning to explore what it is that's made this problem. The work of hunters is another thing. So in other words, we know it's not hunters, and here's how we know that. I have come after them and made repair where they have left not one stone on the stone, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. So in other words, they would have torn the whole thing down just to get at this rabbit. Um, so I know that it's not them based on the way that the arrangements of stones that have fallen. The gaps, I mean, no one has seen them made or heard them made, but it's spring. Okay, so here's, we know it's spring. Um, so the season itself should indicate, if we read it kind of from that universal perspective, we know that this is sort of an idea of newness, um, of freshness, of fresh starts, okay? But at spring mending time, we will find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. So this wall separates, of course, the speaker, speaker's property from his neighbor's property. We keep the wall between us as we go, to each the boulders that have fallen to each. So some on his side, some on my side. And some are loaves, and some so nearly balls, we have to use a spell to make them balance. So please notice that suddenly there are several indications here that there's something almost otherworldly going on. Uh, it becomes a little bit more, the, the speaker uses terminology and imagery. And imagery is simply words that enable you to see, smell, taste, touch. You know, it evokes the senses, okay? Um, and so the speaker begins to use words that indicate something almost mystical, almost surreal. We have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are until our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game, one on a side. It comes to a little more. There where it is, we do not need the wall. Now, and suddenly, the speaker starts examining why. <laughs> why do we do this every year? Why is it that we continue putting this wall up? He is all pine, and I am apple orchard. In other words, neither one of us are growing livestock. It's not keeping livestock separate. He's got pine trees, I've got apples. My apple trees will never get across to eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, good fences make good neighbors. Now this is where I think a lot of students misinterpret this poem. Because this sounds logical, right? You stay on your side, I stay on my side, we'll be happy coexisting together. But is that really the point of this poem? 
spring is the mischief in me. So here's that whole idea, um, symbolism of spring. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I asked to know what I was walling in and walling out. And this, these are key lines right here. Before I built a wall, I'd asked to know why. And to whom I was like to give offense. The thing there is that almost like nature herself is trying to tear this wall down, that wants it down. I could say elves, and there's another little supernatural kind of hint to him. But it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him there bringing a stone grass firmly by the top in each hand, like an old age, old stone savage. Now here's a, an idea that helps reinforce this, um, this, uh, this undercurrent that this wall is not needed and his neighbor is holding on to outmoded ideas. He's essentially comparing him to a Stone Age savage, okay? Uh, something primitive, something ancient. Um, that we've outgrown. He moves in darkness as it seems to me, not of woods only in the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's eye. Now here's the key. Well, this is how we've always done it, right? And he likes having thought of it so well, he says again, good fences make good neighbors. So as I mentioned in the last live session, um, I always sort of emphasize we rule out irony first. When you read, especially poetry, rule out irony first. Does the poem really mean what it's saying, or is there evidence to support a different reading that the poet actually intends somewhat the opposite of what might initially be obvious? And in this case, the poet does mean the opposite. Um, that, that indeed, the question is, why do, build, why do we build walls? Why do we build walls when they're unnecessary? And I think that this works as a metaphor of, about walling people out, the whole idea of being separate, being isolated, um, staying apart. So we can all agree, sure, that you know, probably fences and neighborhoods or whatever are probably effective. But the, the deeper idea here is, why do we keep ourselves separated from each other? You know, and, and the answer is, well, because we always did. You know, this is what my dad did. This is what my dad said. And so, uh, and that's not always the answer, but in this particular case, that's exactly what Frost is trying to, uh, to illuminate, uh, this sort of perpetuation of something that's no longer needed. So if we go back to the talking points, I think I've covered them all, but if we go back to the talking points in the PowerPoint, um, Robert Frost is a regional writer, so he mainly writes about New England, um, but his poems have a universal theme. In other words, anybody can relate to them. In this particular poem, he is personifying nature. He is giving nature human characteristics as though nature itself is tearing down this wall and men keep building it back up again. Um, the symbolism in this particular poem has to do with new life, rebirth, spring, right? And, and new ideas, introducing a new idea that, that the neighbor is rejecting, but you notice that the speaker, for the first time, is beginning to consider this himself. Um, so there's something about tradition versus change here, as well as decay and reconstruction, sort of the idea of life cycle and the nature of relationships. Things fall apart, building them back up again, but do you keep the wall in that place? Any questions about this particular point? Because you will be tested on what I've just said. <laughs> um, and, and that's the reason I do hope that anyone who's not attending this um, session definitely watches the PowerPoint because what I'm going out, I mean, watches this live uh, session recording. Because what I'm going over now is essentially what I expect you to understand about these points. So I'll pause and see if you have any questions. Okay, if not, then we're going to move on to the second poem by E.E. E. Cummings. Now, 
all of these poets that we're studying are representative of modernism for different reasons. And they're just representative. Um, there are not a lot of, there weren't a lot of modern poems from which to choose in the text, and I could have pulled in some others, but um, these do well enough. Um, Cummings is known as one of the most um, famous American innovators as far as playing around with line breaks, with words, um, with uh, punctuation, with capitalization. No one did it before him the way that he does it. Um, so you may be familiar with some of his, uh, some of his, uh, eccentric's not the right word, but because he's very intentional about what he does. Um, by the way, I, I want to make a, a, a distinction here between subjective and objective um, readings of poetry. We all have things that we like, um, and or, or maybe you don't like poetry at all. I find a lot of students really don't. Um, or some for some students, their poems have to rhyme. There needs to be regular meter. Uh, otherwise, they, they just don't like it. And that's fine. That's that's subjective. But what I'm doing in, as far as this analysis um, is trying to um, show you a more objective way to kind of look at the poem, besides whether you like it or not. It's more. It has more to do with what the poet's intention, as best we know, was when he uh, or she wrote the poem. Okay. So the first thing to notice is that in just hyphen, um, what that indicates is that it is just spring. So barely spring. That's um, that's what that hyphen does there. It, it makes an immediate connection with the next word. So again, we're in spring. Notice the season. Um, there's a real freshness to this poem. As a matter of fact, I love teaching it in March because it absolutely fits what's going on in the world, usually then. In just spring, now notice there's a break here. There's a, there's a, a space break. This is intentionally how Cummings uh, wrote this poem. In just spring, when the world is mud luscious. Now, obviously what he's done is he's taken two words, put them together to create a whole um, new way of feeling. The diction here uh, isn't that if you're a kid exactly what spring is like right after it's rained, right? It's warm enough to be outside jumping around. Uh, I think about that uh, that little video clip that I think made its way through social media, this little girl walking down this little country lane with her dog. She comes to a mud puddle, kind of wades through it, turns around, goes back and starts jumping and it's really adorable. And uh, But it's it's the whole idea of mud luscious is the way a kid feels about mud, right? Um, so um, that gives you that feel of, of spring. The little lame balloon man, that this is odd. And we're going to come back to the little lame balloon man in a minute. Then notice the, the break here. Whistles, far, and we. And so that spacing is actually imitating the movement of what's happening in the poem. Um, and Eddie and Bill come running from marbles and piracies and it's spring. Now, there is no punctuation other than dashes in this, right? And that's intentional because it gives the feeling, anytime you read a poem that is goes with that, that has no end punctuation, there's no period, there's no semicolon, the goal there is it's, it's to imitate time, as that time is going on and continues going on. And, um, you know, I, I can barely remember being a kid and time, it just didn't exist for me. It's like, it did feel like this day would go on forever and so would my summer and summer would last forever. And, um, and so that's kind of what the, the, the gaps here are supposed to, to, to show. Um, so the little lame balloon man whistles far and we and Eddie and Bill, the, the fact that Eddie and Bill, those two names are run together, uh, indicates how close they are, right? Two little boys playing together, uh, come running from marbles and piracies and it's spring. Notice this is almost stream of consciousness, that it jumps from this, just like kids, from this to that. When the world is, now here's that second great line, um, great word combination, puddle wonderful. Um, again, you know, I just think of that little girl jumping in puddles. The queer old balloon man whistles far and we and Betty and Isabel, so here's these two kids, these two little girls play, playing together. And again, you get that feel, those, you can almost see little kids holding hands and dancing or whatever. From hopscotch and jump rope, and notice this imitates hopscotch, the way the words are placed and the spacing. And it's spring, and the goat-footed balloon man 
And notice that Balloon Man in this case, man in this case, is, is capitalized. Um, and nothing else at this point is capitalized. The kids' names aren't capitalized. Uh, whistles, far, and we, and that's the end of the poem. Um, so the only words that are that are capitalized is man, are man and just. So it's just spring, as though that is a proper noun. That's the actual name of something, but of course it isn't. But it's there to emphasize and make a point, as is the capital capitalization of man. Because in the scene of these two kid, these four kids out playing um, after a rain in spring. Um, the sort of innocence and the fun and the piracies and the marbles and all these things, you have um, the adult life inter, inter um, sort of interloping, right? Um, so let's look at the talking points about this particular poem. The theme of this poem concerns the innocence and the pure joy of early life and early spring, but the introduction, introduction of the balloon man suggests a subversive undercurrent and possible additional layers of meaning. Now, um, you know, you can read several different critics. And by critics, I don't mean people who criticize. I mean um, scholars who actually um, research and write about, you know, they often specialize in a particular poet or a particular type of poetry or a particular um, uh, group of poems, and so they have enough experience to kind of comment on what's happening. And so in this case, critics disagree <laughs> um, as to its interpretation. The tone really is joyful and it's very lighthearted. Notice all that space. It's very light and airy. But it's also, there's irony in it because of that balloon man and foreboding, and there should be an E there, um, depending on how you choose to interpret it. Now, the innovations, and innovations, of course, means um, means new changes. Um, the use of capitalization in lowercase letters, the spacing, the arrangements of the words, and the very, you know, the poem is, is honestly a pleasure to, to read and, and, um, uh, just because of the way that it works and flows. Um, the symbols, of course, spring, but then the balloon man, and this is where um, the interpretations vary because at the very least, we can say that the balloon man, um, and I don't mean to suggest that this, that there's sort of a perverted um, type of impending danger to these children that, that Cummings uh, was suggesting. Instead, it's like the impossibility of, of remaining innocent forever, right? The impossibility of remaining young forever. Um, when it seems like life will go on, that time will go on forever, and instead you have this intrusion of this character, the balloon man, and um, several, he can be interpreted several different ways. He could be a satyr figure. If you know your Greek mythology, that's a, a, a an allusion to half man, half goat. Um, these were creatures that essentially were connected to Dionysus, the Greek god of wine and revelry. Um, we usually think of sort of more the human base nature of satyrs, you know, sexual pleasure, overeating, drinking a lot. Um, so that's sort of a sort of a disturbing idea, but that those are parts of the things of some people's adulthood, right? Then the idea of Peter Pan, the, the Peter Pan uh, who didn't grow up and who came and led the Lost Boys and, and, and that kind of figure. Or the Pied Piper, and if you remember that children's folk tale about the Pied Piper, um, a town was overrun with rats or mice, I can't remember which, I think it was mice. And um, so the townspeople paid this guy who had this magical flute and was able to pipe. Uh, whenever he piped, things would follow him, and so he piped the mice out of the city, but then they refused to pay him, so he came in and he piped their children out of the city uh, or the town. Um, and so the idea here, I think, um, in that alternative reading, if you want to read it just purely as pure joy, um, that would be my preference. But the suggestion, because of the balloon man and because of the capital letter and that later, is the idea of the intrusion of adult life, um, that things cannot stay, that people do not stay young and innocent forever, that there's a, we grow up um, and life, right? All right, any questions on this point?
All right, if not, because uh, I want to keep this at an hour, so I'm going to go with to the longest poem first, and then we'll finish up with Marianne Moore's poetry. Um, the love song of, of J. Alfred Prufrock is a dramatic monologue. A dramatic monologue is a character who d is doing the talking. A literal, um, the, the speaker is the character in the poem itself. And the irony of dramatic monologues, and this poem is full of irony, but the, um, the irony in dramatic monologue is that the um, speaker reveals more about himself than, or herself than anything else. Um, they kind of give themselves away by what they say. Now, the poem begins with an epi uh, epigraph. And an epigraph are lines from another poem, sometimes in modern poetry or postmodern poetry, lines from a movie, lines from song lyrics, that actually point to the theme of the work. And in this case, um, if you read the notes in the textbook, this epigraph comes from Dante's Inferno. Um, now, if you've ever read Dante's Inferno, Dante travels to hell. And essentially, the Inferno is less about really this idea of, of, of a religious afterlife and more about uh, it, was, it's a, it was a very political document because a lot of um, Dante is Italian was Italian and so a lot of the people in levels of different levels of hell there are nine levels a lot of people in different levels of hell were Italian popes um, who had transgressed uh, and were being punished uh, Italian government officials who were had done things wrong. Some of Dante's own enemies he put in different levels of hell. So, um, and so this particular character who's speaking here is confiding in, to Dante because it's well known that once you go, once you're in hell, you can't get out of it. Which of course Dante ultimately does. So the character who's speaking thinks that his secrets will be safe with by telling Dante this um, because no one else will ever know about it. And of course that's ironic um, because. Prufrock is actually um, this character, J. Alfred Prufrock, um, the speaker, is actually revealing a lot about himself, but he's doing it in such a way that he thinks nobody else will ever know. Um, now, the audience to whom he's addressing these comments um, can be interpreted in several different ways. And again, I've read quite a few different critics, and there are different people who say different things. Um, uh, and I don't know that it necessarily matters. The main point is that he is confessing his deep, dark secrets and fears, thinking that they all, nobody will ever know about it. The irony is, you know, you can read, everybody knows about it. It's revealed. Um, it's written in text. So, um, Prufrock, um, the name itself, should, it's stilted, it's formal, it sound, he sounds like a banker, right? It's supposed to make you kind of get that impression. Uh, and the fact that it's a love song is quite ironic because it's a poem without love. Uh, it's a poem of a man who longs for love and doesn't know how to, is so alienated from people that he doesn't know how to connect and actually find love. Now the you and I, the I, the you um, can be, he can be addressing the audience, the reader, um, you know, somebody who's with them. Um, some of the critics have suggested that he's talking to a prostitute and there is some indication here um, that that could be the case. Um, that um, he is revealing something to somebody he doesn't know, uh, and he doesn't know him, and therefore his secrets are safe. Um, potentially, you know, that, that reading may hold up. All right, so let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out. Now, now remember the, the symbolism of the 24 hour day. So it's um, spread out against the sky, and I think we find out a little bit later it's 8 o'clock at night. Um, so we know that it's, it's sort of that whole idea of, of not quite winter, not quite old age, right, but definitely getting there. Uh, spread out against the sky like a patient etherized on a table. Ether, of course, was the old uh, anesthesia that was used to perform surgery um, in the early 19th, uh, 20th century. Um, and so the whole idea of, of somebody spread out like a patient on a table, um, that's you can tell from the images themselves that this it creates this tone, this sort of despairing, um, depressing tone. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights and one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants and oyster shells. Now, by the way, this is um, the 
particular picture that he paints here is of a cityscape. All right, so um, so where we had the countryside and the apple orchard and mending wall, um, and then we had sort of this almost like a park setting in, in just with these puddles and these children playing, um, like in a park. Here's a cityscape, and this is um, a picture of kind of a, an urban, kind of a dark, damp urban area. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets like muttering retreats of restless nights and one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. So the whole idea is um, that the floors themselves are covered with sawdust, kind of like in a, in one of those old cheap bars or saloons you used to, uh, they use in movies sometimes um, that are close to, uh, close to the like harbors. Um, so if people spill beer, it just goes into the sawdust, right, or their drinks. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question of do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. There are a lot of questions. That's actually one of the, um, the organi organizing principles of this poem is asking questions and not answering them, just leaving them there, like rhetorical questions. Um, in the room, the women come and go talking to Michelangelo. Now, this little couplet, this is called a couplet, when you have two rhymed lines that kind of either end something or are set apart like this, um, it's called a couplet. And the purpose of this couplet is to kind of interject this idea, notice that women are not described. Um, this is, it's just this little brief moment in time where you've got um, people talking about sort of mindless chatter. Um, Michelangelo sounds like there's sort of high-minded discussion, but it really, um, really is more of an indication. They come and go talking to Michelangelo. It's this idea of almost like meaningless chatter. The yellow fog that rubs its cat upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongues into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft, now notice it's October, so uh, if we're talking about the, the symbolism, uh, we're in fall here. We're clearly in fall. We've got dusk, we've got October, and we're going to find out a little bit later that Prufrock is in the fall of his life. He's at that point where he's asking these big major questions because he's a lonely man who feels somewhat isolated from people, and it's almost too late for him. That's how he's feeling. Uh, a soft October night curled once about the house and fell asleep. This is a lovely description here of fog. And uh, it's a metaphor um, that compares fog to a cat. But notice that it's yellow fog. And yellow fog is not healthy. That, mean it's, that means it contains particulate or smoke or something. And indeed, there will be time for the yellow smoke the slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time. There will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. Now, one of the things to notice about this line is that he tries to put on a front, all right, to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you, and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions. And this is his life. This is a man who is paralyzed emotionally and cannot make a move. He doesn't move forward. He doesn't move backward. He stands still. It's almost as though he hopes nobody notices him. And for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. Um, this almost sounds very British, doesn't it? In the room, and then here's this couplet again, kind of dividing up the, the, the poem. Um, it's almost like an irrelevance. This is, it's, it's almost like his life is this irrelevant to have this sort of, uh, these unknown people kind of interrupting the picture. And indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare? Do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. Here's how we know they will say how his hair is growing thin. This is how we know he's aging. Um, and that he's aware that he's aging, and he's so worried about what people think about him. They're going to look at the back of his head and talk about his bald spot. 
I'm wearing coat, my collar mounting firmly to my chin, my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. In other words, he tries to dress the part, right? But he's so obsessed with how people think about him. Um, these are two of my favorite lines. Do I dare disturb the universe? Right? A man afraid to act. In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all. Now he's totally in his head, he's introspective here, um, and, and, and really despairing. I mean, he's coming to the point of despair by examining his life. For I've known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I've measured out my life. This is very, very sad. I've measured out my life with coffee spoons. Coffee spoons are the little ones, right? Um, it's not the big soup spoon. It's a little bit at a time. I know the voice is dying with the dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? Again, asking questions and not answering them. And I've known the eyes already, known them all. The eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, and when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? So he's feeling like, you know, the whole idea of, of the pin um, is an entomologist, entomologist who, um, like, for example, used to take butterflies and they take stick pins and they, and they, pin them down to examine them under microscopes. That's how he feels, like it, like this insect that's been pinned down and that people are looking at him. And truth, probably nobody's paying any attention to him at all, right? But he, um, which is also part of the sadness of this. And I've known the arms already, known them all. Arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight down with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl, and should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say I have gone at dust through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises in the near you have the dust breathless again? Um, and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged claws. Now, this is a crab reference, right? Crabs are bottom dwellers. <laughs> and so this is talking about time scuttling across the floors of silent seas, right? Um, this whole idea of being a bottom dweller and um, being connected to what? Yeah, you know, the floors of silent seas. And there's a, notice the poem ends with the sea reference with mermaids kind of playing, coming out of the water. But he, you know, basically refers to drowning at the very end, the whole idea, and, and water can symbolically refer to emotions, it can refer to the subconscious, um, and the afternoon, the evening, sleep so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me, so I'm talking about the afternoon. Um, should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head run slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, yes, this is a reference to John the Baptist, that's in a biblical illusion, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, then I have seen the eternal footman, that of course is death, right? Hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. So all of this has to do with fear. Notice that there's not real relationship here. Um, there's not real connection here. And it would have been worth it, after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, it would, have, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead. Again, there's a biblical illusion. Come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one, settling a pillow by her head, should say, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. In other words, he longs for relationship, but he's afraid of being rejected. Right? He's afraid of being misunderstood. He's afraid of being rejected. And would it have been worth it, after all, after it? Would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets and dooryards and the sprinkled sheets? Streets after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail on the floor, and this, and so much more. It is impossible to say just what I mean. 
So in other words, he's looking back at his life and saying, if I'd taken this chance, would it have been worth the, would it have been worth, you know, the rejection or the fear of rejection? But as if a magic lantern through the nerves and patterns on a screen would have been worthwhile if one settling a pillow and throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. And then here's how he resolves it. This is the turn of the point. This is where we get the end. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. Now, the ir irony here, uh, and this poem is heavily ironic, but the irony here is that Hamlet was the most uh, indecisive of all of Shakespeare's major characters. The whole play, uh, Hamlet doesn't make a decision about whether or not to avenge his father's death until Act 5 of the play. By then, the body's count is huge. Um, so... He's comparing, this indecisive speaker is comparing himself to the, the most indecisive um, character in Shakespeare. But he's saying, no, I wasn't, I'm no Prince Hamlet. Hamlet, in other words, it's like he is not the um, major player in his own life. I am an attendant lord, someone that doesn't even have a name. My whole purpose in my play is to start a scene or two, maybe advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool, differential, glad to be of use cautious, meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times indeed almost ridiculous, at times, almost at times the fool. I shall grow old, I shall grow old, I shall, up, shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. He's quite aware of time passing, his life passing him by. And then notice all these questions. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? so indecisive, so absolutely caught up in his own head. I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. And mermaids in this case are, they're of course a beautiful figure. They're sirens, they are often used as um, symbolically as sirens, the whole idea of them singing, um, essentially calling out uh, the whole idea that they lure men. But notice that he says, I do not think they will sing to me. In other words, they're not talking to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, coming the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. So, of course, this whole idea of the storm. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls raised with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. And the whole idea here is that he ends up absolutely submerged in this sort of despair. That's the whole idea of drowning in this place of all of his questions, and yet he can't move forward. He can't make a so this whole, um, this whole poem is about alienation. Uh, it's about the impotency of someone who is uncommitted and uncommittal and unable to make a decision. Now, I know that we covered a lot really fast. I don't expect you to know anything other than what I just said. Um, and here are a few additional notes. The poem itself focuses on one man's interior life his failure to act, his isolation, and his absolute self-absorption. You know, he thinks that everybody's looking at him. Um, so on one hand, he says, I'm this insignificant figure. On the other hand, he feels everybody's looking at his bald spot, you know. The tone of the poem, based on all those images that we looked at, it's ironic, it's despairing, it's forlorn, it's depressing, um, it's heavy. Um, the innovations in this particular poem, T.S. Eliot was quite the innovator. Um, he did a lot of things differently, these, especially with these cityscapes and these, these um, pieces of uh, what he's trying to recreate is modern man's urban alienation. The whole idea of, of these people who kind of moved to the city, um, tried to move into sort of a sophisticated lifestyle, but then became cut off from other people. And that's part of what he's trying to show here. Um, fragmented pieces, heavy use of illusions. We like, talked about the biblical illusions, the literary illusion like Hamlet. Um, rejection of the romantic tradition um, where everything turns out okay. Um, the use of free verse, not rhyming, not metered, sort of stream of consciousness and musing. Uh, there are lots of symbols and metaphors. I pointed out most of them. Um, fact that it's a dramatic monologue. I pointed out what the epigraph was, the reference to Hamlet and what that meant, the footman, of course, being death at the foot of his bed, the crab along the bottom, the etherized patient, the pinned bug, the mermaids, the cat-like fog, the cityscape, the obsession with his appearance and the treatment of time. All right, um, that was a lot, and I, we're running a little bit over. Does anybody have any questions?
All right, we're going to end really quickly with poetry. We're not going to spend much time with that. Um, Moore, Marianne Moore is kind of a poet's poet. Um, she's really, uh, I've never studied a great deal of, of her work, unlike the other three poets we just covered. Um, but she had some, um, the particular theme of this poem, the reason I usually start with it, is that it concerns um, that for poetry to be meaningful, it's got to deal with everyday life. Concrete languages, instead of sort of flat, we talked about the romantic tradition, but the idea here is that um, a poet can use his imagination, but needs to deal with real things. And that's really what the poem is about. It's told almost in a stream of consciousness style, just like um, uh, proof rock. It's very informal. Uh, as far as most of the language is kind of informal, all this fiddle, that too is an innovation instead of sort of what had previously been kind of high-minded, high high-sounding uh, diction. Instead, she uses language that's more accessible. Um, and we're going to look at a couple of lines really quickly and we'll be done. Um, she starts out by speaking, I too dislike it. The speaker says, and by dislike it, she's referring to the title here, poetry, right? There are things that are important beyond all this fiddle. That's some of that language uh, that is, she's talking about like rigid forms and um, things that appear uh, in, you know, that are just not important to most of us um, who are reading the poetry. Reading it, however, with a perfect contempt for it. In other words, while I may despise it, I may discover that there is in it, after all, a place for the genuine. In other words, it's meaningful if it's genuine. Hands that can grasp, so these are genuine things. Eyes that can dilate, hair that can rise if it must. These things are important not because a high-sounding interpretation can be put upon them, but because they are useful. So in other words, if the poem deals with something that we can connect to as readers, then it's meaningful, then it's okay. Um, and then she gets into derivative poetry, which means people who copy other people, um, thinking they have to sound high-minded, thinking that they have to, you know, that poetry sounds a certain way and uses a certain language. Um, she's basically saying, that's not useful. I don't, we don't admire what we cannot understand. Um, what we do admire are things like the bat holding on upside down or in quest of something to eat. Elephants pushing, a wild horse taking a roll, a tireless wolf under a tree, the immovable critic twink twinkling his skin like a horse that feels a flea, the baseball fan, the statistician, case after case could be cited, did one wish it, nor is it valid to discriminate against business documents and school. In other words, talking about what's important, what's meaningful, all these phenomena are important. One must make a distinction, however, when dragged into prominence by half poets, the result is not poetry. So again, as I said, <clears throat> this poem is more a poem for poets. <clears throat> they tend to appreciate it a bit more, excuse me. But here are the most important lines um, that are quoted in more books. Um, Imaginary gardens with real toads in them. If a poem contains something in it, that the poet has in his or her imagination created, but has the real, has something that readers can connect to, then it is genuine. Then it is worth um, focus. So that's pretty much all I'm gonna say about that, because um, that's the main point. Again, I'm gonna have, um, I'll open up this PowerPoint so that you can look back at the notes that I put in it. Um, and you're only responsible in the test for what I've gone over in this live session, as well as those notes. All right? Anybody have any questions? Because I don't want to keep you any longer. All right. Have a good afternoon. You're welcome.